Hi, I'm Matt Chandler here, pastor of the Village Church. Just want to thank you for streaming uh, this sermon uh, on your device. Uh, I, I wanted to, just before we get going here, uh, just lay before you a deep conviction we have that this video sermon uh, that we've prayed really stirs up your affections for Jesus and shapes you and molds you into the image uh, of the Son um, would just be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way would replace the church you should be plugged into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul. And so please uh, enjoy the next hour or so uh, of this message. We have prayed that God would use it in a profound way in your life. Blessings. Well, how are we? Doing well? Excellent. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. We're going to be, or we're going to start in Ezekiel 37. Uh, so if you don't have a Bible with you, there should be a hard black, uh, hardback black one uh, under your seat or around you. Go ahead and grab that. Uh, it's always of utmost importance that you see that the things that we say uh, in here aren't really my ideas or something that I've come up with, but rather uh, something that we're reading uh, straight from the Word of God. And so if you'll grab that, we'll get going. Uh, just as a, a refresher, if you're a guest with us, maybe this is your first time here, we're in the middle of our fall series. Uh, we've called that series A Beautiful Design, and what we're looking at uh, is really when it comes to humanity, and specifically when it comes to manhood and womanhood, how has God, as our creator, designed us in regards to origin, purpose, and design? And so we've covered uh, origin, and we've covered the purpose of man. We haven't got uh, to women yet. We're going to turn uh, the corner here in the next couple of weeks, and where, as the last three weeks, we've just kind of focused on manhood, we'll then start to discuss and look at what the Word of God has to say about womanhood, because what we've already um, kind of laid down is that, that yes, in, in some ways, uh, my biology makes me male. There's something else that is, has to be present for me to be a man. Agreed? Because you have to agree if you have sons. Uh, otherwise, you have to call my eight-year-old boy a man, and I wouldn't do it. I know him. I wouldn't do it. All right, and, and there are little girls and there are women, so something is taking place that moves males to manhood and females to womanhood. And so this is kind of what we've been digging into. And so uh, we started out talking about God as creator. And if our God is creator, that means that, that he alone has the authority to determine design and determine function. So it's God the creator's role to say, Say, here's how it works best. He is the designer of the machine, if you will, or if you'll remember the C.S. Lewis quote, the, the machine. Yeah, it's he's the one that designed the machine. He's the one who knows how it works best. And when we take matters into our own hands, say, no, no, I know how to use the machine best. We're, we're like um, someone telling the creator how it's actually supposed to be used. And, and so we covered that, and then we got into the Imago Dei, what it means to be made in the image of God, that you and I have an elevated position among the rest of the creative order. And so I kind of had made the, the joke really for two weeks in, in a row that, that if the budget got tight and I had to decide um, between the horse, the dog, my wife, or my kids, that it's kind of a no-brainer on who has to go, right? Uh, it's not my wife. All right, that that decision isn't a mathematical decision. I don't look at the budget and go, money's tight. Who's costing me the most money? She's got to go, right? That's a no-brainer. Like, no one would argue to make decisions like that. Why? Because my wife, made in the image of God, has an elevated worth over any animal in the world. Uh, in fact, I, I use sweet Darren's over here. Hey, Darren, how you doing, boss? You doing all right? He's just shaking. Yeah. So uh, my boy Darren here is worth far more than Secretariat. You know, I mean, literally the, the most uh, amazing horse that's ever been on the planet Earth. I mean, just blowing by fools, just movie made about him kind of horse. Million dollar horse is not even in the same ballpark 
as my friend Darren. Not even close. Why? Because Darren's been made in the image of God. Secretariat hadn't, and God was pleased with the horse, right? I mean, repeatedly in the Bible, he's like, I nailed that. That thing's awesome, right? And Job, how magnificent is the horse with its snorting? It makes men feel terror. Like God kind of like feels like he nailed it, all right? And, and yet, it's an animal and is not in any way any human being's equal because all humans, male and female, bear the image of the creator and have an elevated value and worth over the rest of creation and are stewards of creation, which is why, despite the fact of our elevated position, any type of abuse or neglect of the creative order is wicked and not in accordance with our design. Where we are acting as image bearers, we will then cause humanity and and really the creative order to to flourish. And so that was um, being made in the image. That becomes imperative for a thousand reasons, all right? Where the Imago Dei is understood, almost all that we call wicked starts to um, vanish when we understand it. See, pornography is an Imago Dei issue. Prostitution is an Imago Dei issue. Abortion is an Imago Dei issue. Genocide is an Imago Dei issue. Racism, an Imago Dei issue. Discrimination, an Imago Dei issue. Really, all the horrors of humanity can be drawn back to a failure to understand that all mankind has been created in the image of God. In his image, he created them, male and female, he created them. And then from the Imago Dei, we moved into uh, man and what is the purpose of man. And straight from the Bible, we just looked at man's, really man's call to call on the man uh, to work and keep the creative order. And so what we said is that I wanted to stay away from the word leadership when it comes to men because women can lead. In fact, I've seen some women lead out in spectacularly amazing ways. And so we we pulled out uh, this idea that's a faithful idea to the word of God of male headship. And we defined male headship like this. Headship is the unique leadership of the man in the work of establishing order for human flourishing. And here's what I said, and I'll stick by it. No one even tried because I don't think you can argue with this. Where men refuse to be men, the world breaks down. And where men will step into what God designed them to walk in, mankind flourishes. Now, I'm not speaking simply as a Christian, because if you want to study that economically, go ahead. You'll see it's right. Uh, You want to study it sociologically? Go ahead and study it. You'll find out that I'm right. When sociologists and economists are saying men need to be present in the home, men need to be present in the neighborhood for human flourishing, they're simply tapping into the good design that is revealed in the scriptures. Like as we read the economists and sociologists, I'm going, exactly, because that's what God said. Of course it's not working. Of course, absentee fathers create a crisis in identity in young little boys and little girls. Now, single moms, widows, I said this. I don't want to say that again without saying this again. Where the ideal is lacking, grace abounds. And some of the godliest men I know right now did not grow up in homes where daddy was overly engaged or his engagement was dark. Don't lose heart, sisters. The Lord enters into dark spaces and makes things new. Don't lose heart. But in every domain of study, God has designed the man to have a unique role in human flourishing. He orders things for flourishing. And where men fulfill the role of biblical manhood, women also flourish in their gifts in their zeal, in that they flourish. In fact, the the Bible would tell us that a a wife married to a a good man would flourish like a well-watered vine. All right, so men, that's a a good little litmus test to your leadership. Is your wife flourishing? Now, from there, Bo, angry Bo, (laughs) came out of nowhere last week. (laughs) I'm just kidding, I totally assigned him that, that topic. I know he outed me in his sermon too. Um, and, and so he comes and he starts talking about the hurdles of men uh, because uh, we can look at the data and we can say, yeah, 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 men, men need to play this role, but we can look at reality and see that they don't. 
and that they've punted on this responsibility and that they've refused to fill this space. And so instead of having kind of biblically formed, Holy Spirit strengthened men, we have boys who can shave. We have little boys in grown up bodies. We have eight year olds in 50 year old bodies. We have the abject refusal to enter the difficulty of manhood because being a boy is easier. In fact, the frequency at which men are giving themselves over to comfort and couches when, they're a war, when there's a war waging is staggering. The frequency at which men refuse to lead spiritually in the home. Men, you know that's on you, right? Like God has not deemed your wife the spiritual priest of the family. That falls on your shoulders, men, to set the spiritual climate. The frequency at which men refuse to emotionally connect to wives and children. And we'll talk more about this in the future because sometimes it's not refusal. Sometimes we just don't know how. But again, this, this refusal to even pursue being emotionally connected, poor wives living with robots, the frequency at which single men refuse to pursue godly single women for deep <laughs> friendships that might lead to marriage, these are all those places where men are refusing to step in and deciding to stay in this extended adolescence despite the fact that their bodies have matured to what would be defined as manhood, all right? The, the voice has dropped. We've got to shave some of us uh, more than others, right? That our physical bodies look like men, but our behavior would define us as a boy, and so Bo began to unpack really how this plays itself out. And he defined it really in two ways, correctly defined it in two ways. And by the way, he killed that sermon. If you didn't listen to that, I mean, he was unbelievable, right? Uh, and so um, he, he said that, that men's errors, men's hurdles, is we're prone to selfish passivity, all right, or selfish aggression. And so because sin entered the world and marred the image, because sin has entered in the world and broken the man all the way down to the cellular level, where our iniquities, our bents take us is towards a type of sinful, uh, selfish passivity or towards selfish aggression. And then he did, he had such a brilliant little caveat that even the passive man is not actually passive. He's actively choosing not to fulfill the role that God gave him. And so it comes off as passivity. It, call, it comes off as, I'm going to refuse to engage. But what he's actively doing is refusing to engage as the Lord would have him engage. And it looks like passivity. So in the end, it's selfish passivity. And where this happens and men are given over to selfish passivity or selfish aggression, the stench of death lingers. It lingers in homes. It lingers in churches. It lingers in communities. It lingers in countries. And where men refuse to grow up, humanity's chance at flourishing is nearly non-existent is nearly non-existent. Now, ladies, let's chat for a second before we dive into Ezekiel 37. Let's chat. Um, if you remember, while when we started manhood a couple of weeks ago, I said, need uh, really two things for you or, or from you, or really here are the two ways that you really need to be engaged in this conversation about uh, manhood and what manhood is. There, there's really two parts that you play as we flesh this out. The, the first is expectation, that as we walk through what the Word of God says about biblical manhood, that your expectations of men should rise, all right? The bar should be raised as you hear, this is what God says a uh, man is, and so the bar should raise. Listen to me. Men will rise to the occasion if the bar is high enough. You set it low, you'll find some, more, some moron running in a herd of other morons who steps over that tiny little bar you have. You're more valuable than that. Remember the Imago Dei. Put the bar high. Well, I just, sometimes I feel lonely. Get a cat. Because <laughs> that cat will not cause you the heartbreak that some boy who can shave will. Don't treat yourself so cheaply. So expectation should increase as you hear and learn 
what biblical manhood is. And then as members of the covenant community, your, your role is to not, not just expect, but to encourage men in this. And encourage men in this. Um, wives, encourage your men. We'll talk more about this later. Speak life in him. Where you see him doing these things on the way home, you should be, baby, I thank you for how you're trying to lead in these things. I see you working at this. Thank you so much for how you've filled this space, how you've kind of engaged our children like this, how you've pursued my heart like this, how you manage things so well. Thank you, baby, encourage. And, and then um, single women, en- encourage encourage our single men to be these things. In fact, uh, if they're pursuing you and they're a boy who you can share, I'm just straight up permission from Pastor Matt to go, well, uh, once you grow into your body, we can have this conversation. But for now, I'd rather stay at home with my cat than go out with you, all right? So I, I just lay it down. You, you expect those boys to grow up, and I think you'll be surprised at them going, oh, dang, I need to grow up. And so here, here's what I want to do now. So th- this is the stench uh, of death, all right? Men who are actively walking in um, selfish passivity or selfish uh, aggression, the stench of death in the home, in the church, in the community, in the city, in the country, in the world. Now, now, now that Mad Bow is done, I get to come along and now I want to give you good news, all right? I want to give you the the good news that that our God and the history of our God is God stepping into dead spaces, stepping into the darkness, reaching his holy, pure hands into the stench of death and eradicating it and calling back to life. And so, brothers, my hope is to encourage you today to be what God has you to be. And to lay before you that the Holy Spirit of God will empower you to pursue. Perfection's yours in Jesus Christ. But pursuit has been given to you by the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. Now, with that said, let's look. Ezekiel 37, starting in verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. So, so I, like, uh, I like the detail in which um, the story goes. The, the bones that are laying all over the valley floor, they're very dry. So let's say it this way. Uh, they've been there a while. All right, this isn't um, freshly picked off bones. Uh, this is um, like CSI found this body from 70 years ago kind of bones. All right, you track going, these are dry, dry bones. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you, that's tendons, ligaments uh, upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Verse 11. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Here, these bones are my people. Behold, they say, my people say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, 
I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken it, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Now, this story out of Ezekiel is being prophesied by Ezekiel when he is in exile after the nation of Israel has fallen apart and been carried off in to exile. Ezekiel is promising this, prophesying about this in a time in which all the world's powers that were known are at war with one another. The world was on fire. You had superpowers colliding. You had an ancient superpower in Egypt that had got involved in the mechs. You had world war. And you had world war without television cameras. You had world war without Twitter and Instagram, which means you had a type of darkness and depravity that's hard to get the mind around. And for the people of Israel that had seen their entire country burned to the ground and had been exiled, deported out of their country and put in another country, they felt like all was lost. And yet the promise from God to dry bones is, I'll put you back together. I'll put you back together, an exceedingly great army. I'll enter the chaos, enter the fray, enter the brokenness, and I'll bone by bone, sinew by sinew, muscle by muscle, flesh by flesh, breathe life into you, and where you have been dead and where the stench of death has reigned, you will live, and the stench of death will change to the aroma of my presence." Now, that sounds awesome, but my question is always, okay, how? Right? I mean, because that, that's kind of a ethereal idea. Okay, God can enter dark spaces and he can bring to life, but I, I want to know how. Like, how does that work? Because I hear you and I even believe you, but okay, what now? Right? Okay, praise God. So when does this happen? Right? Who, when do I get breathed on? <laughs> Bones are feeling dry and brittle. When does... When does that happen? Okay. Well, I'm glad you asked that because that's the rest of my sermon. <laughs> so one of the things Bo said last week, um, and he, he, he tied uh, sin and, and, and death together, and, and this is uh, reality. Where there is sin, its dark partner death is always there. Now that's part of what God warned Adam before sin was entered into, had entered into the cosmos. In fact, in Genesis chapter two, verse 16, here's what God told Adam. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? Die. If sin enters the cosmos, you're going to to die. And we know that death is a type of holistic death, all right? You've got physical death that's a reality, but you also have spiritual death, which is really the underlying issue that really pushes men towards selfish passivity and selfish aggression. And then this will be uh, one of the themes found in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, this was covered at length last week where there is sin, that sin is leading to death, and where there is death, there is the stench of death wherever that sin is playing out. So if we go back and look at Bo's beautifully built out on the ground examples of selfish passivity and selfish aggression, all of these things are sin leading to death or they are simply the stench of death on men who know better than to operate this way. And we'll address both in our time together. So this is selfish passivity. This such great list. The refusal to worship God. The refusal to enjoy, honor, serve, know, obey, and delight in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is a sin leading to death that carries with it the stench of death. Um, he also said engaging fantasy instead of reality. Now, 
um, your fantasies are always going to be a lot better than your reality, correct? Unless you, your fantasy is things being more difficult for you in the world, right? In which case, come see us. We need to walk with you a bit in some counseling, all right? If, if your fantasy is like, man, I had a couple of things that went right today. Let me just sit here and think about what if those went wrong too, there we go. I'm going to drift off to sleep thinking about that, right? No, fantasy is always more comfortable, easier, right? And, and the Bible's going to say that's sin that leads to death and therefore carries with it the stench of death. Now, you want me to put this on the ground? Show me a man who spends time in fantasy rather than engaging in reality. And I'll show you a home that has the stench of death as daddy refuses to engage mom, engage the children, and engage the spiritual climate of the home. The stench of death. It goes on from there, checking out emotionally and spiritually Self-pity, silence in a moment where wise words are needed, like saying something encouraging to your wife or children or friend, or like confronting sin in your wife or children or friend. Of course, such silence means we are actively avoiding conflict, we are avoiding vulnerability, or we are avoiding work. Excuse making or complaining, those are sins that lead to death and therefore carry the stench of death. Disorganization and procrastination, that one stung me. I almost got it off the, I almost took it off this weekend. Um, busyness to avoid responsibility, being lethargic in work, service, or ministry, not getting out of bed when the alarm clock goes off, leaving difficult labors, labors to others, refusing to help someone in need, silence in a moment where words are needed, gluttony or apathy, lack of ambition about matters truly important to God and others, either not being excited about God worshiping the gospel, his word, or not being appalled about false worship, child abuse, abortion, racism, oppression, sexual immorality, especially in our own lives. These are selfish passivity actions that men give themselves over to that are sins that lead to death, that carry with it the stench of death. This is how that plays out. And then if we go over now to the selfish aggression side, pornography, domestic abuse, one in three women abused by their spouse, thoughtless criticism, correction, nitpicking, and vocalized displeasure to get other people to change and do what we want, withholding affection and attention when someone fails, using money, power, and a host of other devices to control others, Mocking, belittling, and demeaning others to exalt ourselves. Slandering or harming another person's reputation to get ahead. The whole spectrum of a retaliation towards others when we don't get our way from the silent treatment to blatant acts of violence. Veiled anger disguised as sarcasm. Abandoning your wife. Deriving pleasure from watching other people suffer. These are sins that lead to death and therefore carry with them the stench of death. And where they are present, rather than the aroma of the gospel and life and flourishing, you get the stench of death in a stunted beauty. A stunted beauty. And then to top that all off, all of this takes place in a very broken world, all right? So not only do, do we have selfish passivity and selfish aggression that we're wrestling with, but both of those are being played out on a created order that's broken itself. And Genesis 3, 17 through 19 tells us about that. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Uh, so not only do we have sin leading to death that carries with it the stench of death, but all of creation actually is warring against us as we go. Now here's what I've always appreciated about the Bible. It never tries to paint a picture that's inconsistent with reality because all we just read is what you'll see anytime you log on to CNN.com. This is the world we live in. 
This is our experience. This is how life actually works. The creative order is broken. Uh, we, we see it in a thousand ways every year as the earth, according to Romans 8, groans and looks forward to its own reconciliation. Uh, we see this often as, as, as men uh, abuse or men refuse to engage. We see this. We live this. We wrestle with this. We have to work in the midst of this. And yet it's in this kind of Mad Max in the Thunderdome type of picture I can't wait till the new one comes out and then the other half of you will actually get that illustration. <laughs> Most of you don't remember Mel Gibson when he was like 23 or what, however you old when they shot that. It's in this kind of apocalyptic, everything's broken mess that God begins to call the bones to come back together. And in fact, I, I want you to see this. Let me throw it up there. Ephesians chapter two, um, starting in verse four, says this. Here in Flower Mound, we actually just sang uh, these words um, uh, almost word for word. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us what? Alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So what has God done for us in Jesus Christ? It is in Jesus Christ and his life, death, and resurrection that God says to the bones to come back together, that says to the dead to wake up, that says to the dead you're alive again, that grants the breath, that puts the bones back together, that gets those tendons and ligaments to connect, and on top of our spiritual resurrection, he seals this in us, Romans 6.6, 6, not only are we not dead men anymore, listen to this, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be what? Enslaved to sin. Now here's where things get really interesting for us men, all right? Here's what's just happened. In Christ, we have been raised from the dead. So all that whole list, sinful passivity, sinful uh, aggression, now we've been saved from that. We've been called out of death and into life by Christ. His death absorbs all of God's wrath towards us, his righteousness imputed to us so that God sees us as positionally perfect. On top of that, God gives to us the Holy Spirit to strengthen the inner man to pursue our God-given place as walking in headship. So now that we've got the Holy Spirit in, inside of us, strengthening us, we don't have to say yes to any of this anymore. Like before God saved us, before Christ raised us from the dead, before the Holy Spirit was given to us, these things were going to own us. They were going to get us. Now that we have the Holy Ghost, we can say no. We can say I'm not walking, I'm not doing that again. And it's the Spirit's power that strengthens us. Which means men... You have not been created for comfort or the couch. When I said early on that the frequency that men give themselves over to comfort and couch, I'm trying to help you process and understand that God has created you for war, not comfort. In fact, the more comfort you have, the more you lack genuine biblical masculinity. The more you give yourself over to comfort, you give yourself, and don't go all brave heart, paint your face blue on me. All right? Sometimes the war men have been called into is that type of war. Most of the time, the war is to get up off the couch. Like the war, more often than not, is me getting up and pursuing my wife's heart when I'm exhausted and don't feel like it. A lot of times, the war for me is to manage our budget in a way that our family can flourish and no one has to worry about those things. 
Sometimes the war for me is to go tuck in the kids and pray for them and talk to them about their day and what the best part was and what the worst part was and, and really, uh, how's your heart? Where are you wrestling with right now? How, how are you thinking about God? How are you, right? Because there's sometimes I'm just tired and I'll be really honest so we can be friends here. Sometimes they're, by that point of the day, they're getting on my nerves. There's not a lot of good gonna happen if I go in there. <laughs> oh, you guys are so awesome. I'm, I'll try to be the type of parent you are one day. Right? Like there's sometimes I'm just like, I don't want to go in there. I want to just sit here. I'd like to start getting ready for bed myself. I'd like to finish reading this book that I'm in. I'd like to, right? Sometimes the war is on that ground. It's not face painted blue running into the field to slaughter the Lord's enemies. Sometimes just freaking getting up, going sitting across the table with my wife and asking how she's doing. What the Lord, what's the Lord been showing you? What's he been teaching you? But what are you struggling with right now? You encouraged in the Lord? You in a dry space? Where are you, baby? Sometimes that's where the war's taking place. In fact, look at me. Most often, that's where it's taking place. And the temptation that even now I wrestle with is, is staying on the couch. Now, men, let me... Let me help set you free here to pursue this. Look at me. You are not going to be able to do this. This is the Lord's expectation and command. Look at me. But you will not be able to do it. You will fail. You will fall. You will choose the couch. You will choose to not engage. You will choose, right? You will. You're going to fail. But let's make sure we understand what the Bible's teaching here. All right, Christ has granted to you because of his death and resurrection, positional perfection, and has now freed you up to pursue. So if you think that the goal is perfection, that every time you nail this and do it perfect, you will lose heart and stop trying. You will fall back into the stench of death, especially around self-pity, and you will refuse to engage like you should. But if you understand that perfection has been given to you in Christ and what God has called you to is pursuit, then you can get up and start pursuing again. And in fact, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago. I just love it. God so brilliantly designed the pursuit of him that when we choose the couch, when we choose comfort, and we own it and realize we did it, the gospel has an opportunity to take even deeper root in our home as dad is honest about where he's failed, where husband is honest about where he fell short. In fact, let's look at that right now. Ephesians chapter 5, 13 through 14 says this. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So men, this is where we need to camp out. In fact, I'm going to ask you just to leave that text up. Here's what we're doing here. We're, we are uh, being exposed by light. And so over the course of the last three weeks, as we've unpacked what biblical manhood is, and we've talked about what it means to work it, what it means to keep it, as we looked at what our hurdles are, and now we're looking at at redemption. Here's what's happened. Here's what should be happening. The word of God, conversations are bearing weight on you. They're exposing areas where you are falling short. Now, here's the good news. Perfection has been provided. Pursuit is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let me use the word strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Don't want you guys going to Oprah on me. All right, so Holy Spirit strengthening the inner man now for what? For pursuit, for the war, for the fight, to get into the mix, to keep getting up and going. There's a reason we love Rocky Balboa. Not part seven, six, or five, but the early days. Those were awesome. Like no real skill. Like, like five, six or something. But he just keeps getting up. I mean, he just gets drove in all those fights. I mean, I'm doing take a beating. The reason we love that is because we're designed for it. Get up. Been knocked down, yeah. And, and listen, you can get knocked down again. And the Holy Spirit 
will strengthen you time and time and time again to get up. So the light shines on us. We are exposed. Therefore, arise. Um, it's, it's of great irony that pretending to be more of a man than you are actually makes you less of a man than you are. It is of great irony that pretending to be more of a man than you are actually makes you less of a man than you are. Here's what I mean by this. He, he says, uh, arise, all right? uh, get up, all right? w- w- wake up, oh sleeper. All right? and, and now we need to walk. Now that we're awake and, and walking, let's move. And so oftentimes, here's what that means. Oftentimes, what that means is I don't know how to do what God is asking me to do. I just simply don't know how to do it. Like, it's, it's no real secret that men are, in many ways, emotionally stunted. <laughs> Fellas, how often are you asked how you're feeling? You just don't even quite actually know what you're being asked. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's get them up. Don't lie. Like, your wives are raising your hand for it. This is sinful passivity. Your wife's like, Right? We just don't know. Sometimes we don't know. We're emotionally stunted for a lot of different reasons. So I'm like, pursue your wife's heart, and I might as well be speaking in some language you don't know. You're like, well, I do. We live in the same house. I'm doing that all the time. Like Chandler, the other day, I put a coaster under my glass because that's what she likes. Pursued her heart. Nailed it. Right? I mean, we just we don't even know what we're talking about here. We don't even know what... I mean when I say to pursue our wives' heart. Um, So a a couple of things. Men, biblically speaking, masculinity in this moment is to find a man who does know and ask. Not to pretend that you've got it all together, but to acknowledge that you don't and you need help. And man, that's hard for men, isn't it? And, And it starts early. Like, even my boy now is trying to untie his cleats before his game. I was like, you need help? I got it. <laughs> okay, buddy, I'm here when you need it. And then I just hear him go, ah! I was like, hey, well, we talked about this. Give me your shoe. I'll help you out. Why do you get so angry? Let me untie that, right? It's passion. It's not anger. Um, and then, uh, right, we, we start early. And, and so, one, men, find men that can help you. Uh, secondly, he, this is going to sound crazy to you. Have a conversation with your wife. Wives, be gracious. Now, he, here's what I mean, and, and I don't want to start preaching to the women yet. That's coming in a couple of weeks, but um, there's a way in which you can help your husband that will bring a lot of life into your home, and there's a way to handle your husband that will bring the stench of death. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. Um, I have a, a good friend of mine who um, really whether it be home issues or other things, really emotionally stunted. And, and I'm, I'm just, you're going to giggle at this, but I'm telling you, he has a chart that has emotions and definitions for those emotions listed out on it. And when his sweet wife and him talk about how they're doing, um, she, she'll let him use the chart. How, how are you feeling, John? Um, <laughs> it, it's kind of a mix between this one and this one. It's like happy but frustrated. I don't, there's not one that actually fits exactly how I, okay, well, John, how are you, what are you frustrated by? Okay, what's making you happy then? And now they're in a conversation about what's going on in his heart and praise God for her. Because if she wasn't that gracious, this would be conflict all the time, even though he earnestly desired to learn how to do it. Talk to your wives, men. Ask them, what kind of question should I be asking you that I'm not? Can you help me? Can you ask questions of me? Can you pull on my heart? Because I don't know how to answer what you're trying to get to. And so see, if we'll serve one another like this, if we'll serve one another like this, we got an opportunity here to step into that space that God has called us to step into as men. This might sound crazy to you, but the same thing's true with your children. Children are hard because you have to think of ways to ask questions that can't be answered yes, no, or fine, right? I've spent a lot of time going, how do I word this? And then what am I going to do when they, not if they, but when they say, I don't know. 
And then the consistency of being there at night. Men, the reason I tell you to climb into your children's bed at night with them for just a few minutes is because it's in that quietness that you can show empathy, that you can engage, that you can ask questions about their day, that you can ask how that made them feel, that you can then engage their feelings on a way that say, uh, are those um, feelings legitimate or are they not? And what I mean by that is not that we lie to them. All right, we don't tell our daughters when we're laying in bed with them and they're like, this, this girl at school is mean to me. And we don't go, well, one day you're going to be prettier than her and they're all going to be jealous of you. <laughs> I've seen her mama, trust me, right? You don't, you don't say that. Here's why, because it might not be true. Here's, here's what you do say, fellas. And, and here's what's funny. I get made fun of this in my house now, like it happened this week at our dinner table. Um, I was cuddled up with uh, Audrey, and these girls had been mean. They'd called her a name, and, and I said, man, I, I remember, gosh, I remember when I was probably a little younger than you, and I was out at the playground, and um, these boys called me names. I just remember it hurt my heart. I just remember what that feels like. I'm so sorry, boo. And so she said, what'd they call you? And so I said, well, they called daddy a spaz. <laughs> and so now anytime one of my kids acts crazy, my wife just looks at me like, that's you, spaz. That's you. <laughs> so yet that empathy with Audrey made her squeeze into me. Like me saying, daddy remembers that. I, I, I remember what that feels like. That's awful. Daddy knows. So in that moment, she like nuzzled in even deeper. And say, well, you're smarter than they are. Well, you know what, boo? You, like, just know, I remember I've been there. It hurts. But it's not true. I know you. I know you better than they do. And not, I know you better than those little trollops do out at the play. I mean, no. <laughs> I know you. Seen your heart. It's not true about you. Men, that's why we climb in bed with the babies. That's why we put them down, if at all possible to engage their hearts. Arise, wake up, walk, and the glory of Christ will shine on you. This will never be easy, men. If you're hearing me say that following Christ and filling our space as biblical men is going to be easy, I want to, you to hear me say, it is never going to be easy, but rather it will be worth it. As your wife flourishes, as your children begin to understand the things of the Lord, you begin to understand that all of this is worth it, and then it just gets reinforced. And even when things go bad, you feel that kind of hardwired call to battle, pushing you back towards the front. Don't give in to selfish passivity. Don't give in to selfish aggression. You don't have to. Strengthened by the Holy Spirit, fight. It will be one. And for some of us today, here's the reality. Uh, some of us, this isn't even a chance because we haven't given our lives to Christ. We haven't been resurrected at all. We're still walking in death. And so as long as you're walking in death, the stench of death will always be there. And so for those of you who have not put your faith in Christ, maybe you've just been hanging out with us for the last six months and, and maybe over the last few weeks or last few months something clicked and you're like, man, I think I'm a Christian, not quite sure what to do with that. I think I believe, I, I think God's done a work in my life, just not sure what to do with that. We need to do something with that today. Um, the Bible says that what's going on is God's transferring you out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son, um, that, that God is giving you uh, a new heart, a, a new spirit. And so we need to do something about that. And, and for many of us in this room, we are Christians. We have just refused to get in the fight and we have allowed the stench of death to float around us, to float around our homes, to float around this church as we refuse to enter into the space that God has called us to because it's hard. And for us, the light shines on us. We confess, repent, and start pursuing again. 
Husbands, daddies, there's things we might need to own this afternoon. Wives, I would encourage you on the way home to where you see your husband filling these spaces, thank him. You have such power over the mind and heart of your man. I don't want to start preaching my message for two weeks from now. Use that power on the way home to encourage him. I, I see you pursuing in this way. I see you, thank you for this, thank you for this, thank you for this. Don't go, did you hear what he said when he was saying about getting those kids to bed? <laughs> Not helpful. Ladies, look right at me. You are a terrible Holy Spirit. Don't fill that space. You'll, you'll actually jack up what the Lord's trying to do in your man's heart. Stop. Encourage where he's doing these things well. When's the last time you said it to him? When's the last time you encouraged him in that way? Where he has rejected passivity, where he's rejected aggression, where he's pursuing the Lord. He's not perfect. No man is perfect. Christ, you're not married to him. Just thank him for how he's pursuing. Single men, we seek to become this. Single women, expect this of them. And may we rest in the resurrecting work of Jesus Christ that redeems men from their hurdles. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these men and women pray specifically for my brothers, that we would arise, that we would get up, that we'd wake up, that we would let the light of Christ shine on us and that the glory of Christ would be seen. For my brothers in here, maybe my sisters in here, that over the course of the last few months, few weeks, have said, I, I think I've become a Christian, think I've, I've, I've laid my yes down, think, think that I am one, I just don't know what to do with that, Father, that you would um, grant them the grace to move today, to grab the hand of a pastor or minister and just say, I think I'm a Christian, can we talk about that? I pray for the boatload of us men today, that although we have been resurrected, continue to carry with us the stench of death? Might we be quick to confess? Might we be quick to repent? Might we be quick to get up and start to pursue again as imperfectly as we always will? Grow us, help us. It's for your beautiful name. Amen.